welcome to uh, another broadcast from Aramaic Broadcasting Network and also broadcasting on Trinity Broadcasting Network. We wish you a happy Christmas. We're glad you're with us today for this last of our Christmas fundraiser program. And we would ask that uh, if you have been blessed by all of our programs, that you would give us a call at 248-416-1300 and help uh, us with uh, uh, your donations to keep this uh, television program on the air. It does cost $75,000 a month to do that. And as you help us to uh, help others and people come to know Christ, God remembers your labor, and we would certainly appreciate your help. Also, if you have questions for any of our panelists, you're welcome to call the same number, and uh, we will be more than happy to uh, put you on the air and let you uh, ask our panelists a question. Our panelists this evening, uh, joining us on Skype, are Joe Carey. Joe has been studying Islam since 1999. He holds a master's degree in Christian apologetics from Biola University with a special focus on Islamic studies. Joe is an ordained minister and has been teaching classes in apologetics at his church and uh, Muslim evangelism since 2005. Welcome, Joe. And glad to be us, here. Merry Christmas, uh, everybody. I'm glad you're here, brother. I certainly am. And also joining us on Skype is uh, Tony Grule, who is Radio Christie Social Media IT and HR Support Specialist and Assistant Director of Chapter Formation. He is also an on-call community apologist for churches who have him come and equip their congregations with, and their youth groups and their small groups. Tony also does uh, weekly uh, uh, evangelism, door-to-door -door and, 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 and public evangelism, and he helps uh, equip other Christians to do the same, and he also has shows here on the Aramaic Broadcasting Network you can tune in to watch. Also joining us in the studio is Scott Cherry. He's a, an ordained Christian minister. His mission is to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Dearborn, Detroit area and elsewhere, especially universities. Scott was originally trained as an elementary school teacher and worked in education for 10 years. He has an MA in education, but he's more interested in theology, philosophy, and evangelism. Also joining us here in the studio uh, might be a familiar face to some of you is Pastor Joseph Habibi. He's been a Christian for almost 50 years and he's been a youth minister in Egypt. He's also been working with this ministry for many years and has been a guest speaker as well. He currently ministers to the Arabic uh, speaking peoples here in the Detroit area. So welcome to all of our panelists. And for everyone watching, our topic this evening is the, min the meaning of the birth of Jesus. And to get us started with that, we're going to have a short video clip for you to watch. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He 
blesses the young, he serves the unfortunate, he regards the age, he rewards the diligent, and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him, he's a key to knowledge, he's a wellspring of wisdom, he's a doorway of deliverance, he's a pathway of peace, he's a roadway of righteousness, he's a highway of holiness, he's a gateway of glory. What a powerful video clip that uh, describes Jesus. But what amazes me, and I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 2, is the birth narrative of how Jesus came into the world, and yet he became what you saw on that uh, short video clip. And I'm going to read to you uh, starting from verse 7 to uh, verse 14. And it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in cloths. And laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you, and you will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. And they said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to all men, upon whom his favor rests that's who came into the world that's who we looked at in the videotape and my first question is going to go to you brother and that is who was that baby lying there in a the manger I, I think that baby was the most profound revelation of God the earth has ever known that the universe can be reconciled by the gift of that holy Christ child Jesus who was given as a fulfillment of messianic prophecy, numerous prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the deliverer, to the savior of the Jewish people, but not only to the Jewish people, to the entire world. The scripture tells us in one of the best known verses that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish, would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And later in the same chapter, for God did not give his son to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. So God is a God of saving. And during this time uh, of which Christmas becomes the apex or the, uh, the culmination of a season known, known as Advent, um, Anticipation is built into the themes of Advent, which started this year on December 3rd. Anticipation and expectation and awaiting and hope and then longing and all these other kind of themes, things that, that are part of the, the soul of a human being. Because we know there's something wrong with the world. 
There always has been something. No one says the world is just the way it should be. And, and we know there are things worth hoping for. And there are better things. It's wired into us. Jesus becomes all of that for us. God's means of demonstrating his love to the world through that Christ child who became the man that he did become, a miracle worker and a shower of compassion and reaching to the downtrodden and to the broken. And ultimately, he gave himself. He gave himself to rescue the world from brokenness and sin, alienation from God. Amen. Amen. Joe, I have a question for you, too. Um, Joe, was that just merely a human being lying there in the manger, or was it some, somebody who was human and maybe even more? That was not merely a human being. Um, that right there that, that Scott was just talking about was God come down in human flesh. Um, for the, the, the forgiveness of sins for all the people of the world. Um, this is a very special time that we're celebrating, and, and many uh, non-believers, Muslims, um, skeptics, and so forth, miss the primary um, purpose for the celebration of what we're getting ready to celebrate in just a, a matter of a couple of days. God came down in human flesh. Let me, t let me tell you about Let me relate to you a story I had one time. Um, I was actually talking with with an imam in central Kenya one time, and he, he, he admitted to me, we, we asked, we, we were talking back and forth, and, and he admitted to me he, he knew nothing about Christianity. And he, he asked a very profound question, and his question was this, after we had chatted for a while, he said, so why did God have to become a man? And I thought that was a great question. And so I, I said to him, I said, I said, Sheikh Jamil, I'm, I'm not going to answer that using my own words. Let me tell you what the Bible says. And I just opened up the Bible to Philippians chapter 2. And I began reading from verse, began reading at verse 5. And it says this, it says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I looked at that shake and I said, that's why God had to become a man. And he, he, he just had this look in his eyes like, I never thought about that. And he got it. Seeds were planted that day. That is awesome. And uh, indeed, uh, Jesus Christ is God. And, and speaking of that, I want to ask you a question, Tony, as well. What, does, what, would that have mean, what would it mean if Jesus had never come into the world? What would have happened? Well, I think the world would be quite different if he had never come into the world. Uh, many people know about the famous, uh, very popular movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where uh, he asks, uh, you know, he wonders what would life have been like if he had never been born. And then in that fictitious movie, an angel comes and shows him what life would, would, would have been like if he had never been born. And how much bigger and, and amazing uh, of a difference would it be if Jesus had never been born? There's actually a book written by the late uh, D. James Kennedy. It's actually available on Amazon. Uh, there's only about 15 left right now. It's actually called What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And there's actually a 20-point list here. Of course, I can't read the whole 245-page book, but this is a quick overview. Uh, hospitals, which essentially began during the Middle Ages. Universities, which also began during the Middle Ages. In addition, most of the world's greatest universities were started by Christians for Christian purposes. Literacy and education for the masses. Capitalism and free enterprise. Representative government, particularly as it has been seen in the American experiment the separation of political powers, civil liberties, the abolition of slavery, slavery, 
both in antiquity and in more modern times. Modern science, the discovery of the new world by Columbus, the elevation of women, benevolence and charity, the good Samaritan ethic, higher standards of justice, the elevation of the common man, the condemnation of adultery, homosexuality, and other sexual perversions. This has helped to preserve the human race, and it has spared many from heartache. High regard for human life, the civilizing of many barbarian and primitive cultures, the codifying and setting to writing of many of the world's languages, greater development of arts and music, the inspiration for the greatest works of art, the countless changed lives transformed from liabilities into assets to society because of the gospel, and of course, last but not least, the eternal salvation of countless souls. These are all the things which would have not have happened and would not be currently happening if Jesus had not been born, because it's the Christian church, the true followers of Christ, which helped to make all of that stuff happen. And if Jesus hadn't set the example for his followers, well, then his followers wouldn't have gone and continued that work and spread that message that he told them to go out and spread. Thank you, Tony. Pastor Joseph, what do you think uh, are some of the reasons that Jesus came into the world? I'm going to elaborate about our brother, what they said before. I'm just going to go to the Old Testament. Uh, we know in the Old Testament we gave sacrifices of lambs and calves, and, and uh, it becomes to be a ritual and some scripture in the Old Testament, God said, I hated these sacrifices because they are not coming from the heart, from here. So the sacrifices of the old are becoming routine and they have no meaning for mankind. And we know that there is a period of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament, like 400 years where mankind lost hope where we're going from here. Then in the fullness, the Old the New Testament said in the fullness of time, Jesus came. It was action on the theater, uh, motions. Angels appeared to Mary, angels appeared to Joseph, angels appeared to, uh, to the shepherds, angels appeared to the Magi from the east coming to announce to the world that there is the Son of God is coming to redeem mankind. The old sacrifices is gone. He is the only sacrifice for sin for mankind. Uh, that's, I think, why God sent his son from the old to the new to show us the way. And he took our likeness, our humanity, our images. You have to know in the book of Genesis, we are created in the image of God. So when Jesus came, he took that image again to show us the way to God. Thank you, Pastor Joseph. Amen. He did show us the way to God. And that brings me to another question for Joe. Joe, uh, just if I was someone out on the street and I said, you know, I believe in God, so why do I need to believe in Jesus uh, when he is just merely, you know, a good teacher? Well... James says in, in James chapter 2, I believe it was, um, you, you believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they tremble. See, it's not simply enough to simply have mental assent to the fact that, that Jesus was a person walking upon this planet, that he lived a, a historical life, and, and uh, that life can be historically verified through ancient historical sources. We have to take Jesus at his word for who he claimed himself to be. And Jesus was very clear about who he was. In fact, the Bible was very clear about who he was. Way back in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said, Behold, this will be a sign to you. A virgin shall conceive and bear, bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, Matthew gives us a further explanation. He says, he quotes that verse in Isaiah, and it says, You shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with God. Us. So Jesus was not simply a prophet. He was not simply a, uh, a good teacher. He was not simply a, a kind man. He was, in fact, as the Bible says, God with us. And his deity is, is uh, one thing that he claimed for himself more than any other 
um, self-proclamation in, in the New Testament. He claimed to be deity, and he not only claimed it, he provided examples to demonstrate that there was power, in fact, behind who he, he himself claimed for himself to be. Thank you. Uh, on that, I want to go to Scott and ask Scott a question. Scott, uh, you know, Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. And Joe was saying that, you know, Jesus is God. And so what is the gospel according to God? Let's start real succinctly. When, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Joseph in, in, in the, the gospel of, of Matthew, he told Joseph, and you will name him Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So the most simply put, the gospel is that which saves people from their sins. And in this case, it's Jesus. Jesus saves people from their sins. Now, we have to unpack that a whole lot more, especially for people without a Christian background, right? What are sins? Why do we need to be saved from them? What's wrong with just living in our sins and so on? What, what will be the, the consequences of dying in our sins? Okay? Jesus said that to the Pharisees once. If you, if you don't believe my message, you will die in your sins. Okay? Let's assume that's the worst possible outcome, dying in your sins. Okay? Because the Bible teaches all the way from, from the, the beginning, from the book of Genesis, especially chapter 3 when, when Adam and Eve come into the story and they, they disobey God, okay? sin in, is introduced into the grand narrative. Rebellion, okay? brokenness, alienation from God, separation. We know that the story tells us Adam and Eve were, were banished from paradise or from the, from the Garden of Eden. That, that itself is a picture of what has happened between humanity as a whole and God himself. A banishment, an exile, okay, in which hu hu human beings are put out of the presence of God, of his holiness, of his beauty, of his love, and subjected to uh, what, what the Bible says is futility, pain and uh, and fatigue, and misery, and corruption, and all these other things. So what, what, what the gospel does is it captures Jesus into this narrative, into the context of sinfulness and alienation, and it, it gives Jesus as the hope, as he who died on the cross to take on to himself the judgment of God that we deserve, and the consequences of sin and alienation that we deserve. Jesus Christ, that child born in the manger, reconciles us to a holy God and allows us to be accepted by God into his presence for all eternity and gives us the confidence, the assurance of eternal life with him. Amen. And we would encourage you to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We encourage you to do that today. In a few seconds, we're going to be going to our break. And I want to encourage you to call 248-416-1300 uh, uh, for questions uh, for our panelists, uh, to pray with someone if you need to pray with someone. And we would appreciate it if God moves your heart that you would share of your financial resources to continue to bring quality programs to you on the Aramaic Broadcasting Network. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Trinity Channel is now airing live 24-7 on our YouTube channel. Apologetics, debates, and discipling are now constantly streaming for all of our YouTube viewers. Be sure to comment on, like, and share our stream to support Trinity Channel's efforts to disciple all nations. Watch live on YouTube today.
Now in the palm of your hand is the updated ABN SAD app. So you can now watch all the programs, shows, and channels in different languages. You can download the app in the App Store related to your device. Once downloaded, you will see six different categories within the ABN SAT app. The first category being the English category, which includes 18 different channels. The Arabic category includes 31 channels. The Worship category has five channels. The Discipleship category includes five channels as well. For more information, please call the numbers on your screen or visit our website at trinitychannel.com. As it is ABN's mission to go and make disciples of all nations, our discipleship program has spread to several different languages. Reach out to them. He wants you to break up of every division. Any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We started out with these languages, but coming soon are even more. Stay tuned to see these programs come to ABN. Trinity Channel is now airing live 24-7 on our YouTube channel. Apologetics, debates, and discipling are now constantly streaming for all of our YouTube viewers. Be sure to comment on, like, and share our stream to support Trinity Channel's efforts to disciple all nations. Watch live on YouTube today. Welcome back to our broadcast. We want to continue on with what the meaning of Jesus' birth is. And I'm going to begin with uh, Pastor Joseph. You know that little baby, Pastor Joseph, born in a manger, would grow up uh, to be a man. And the Bible says that he is a mediator between God and man. Would you explain what that means, please? Amen. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, Brother mentioned, he came for a purpose, for a reason. And the reason to build a bridge between mankind and God. And the bridge was the cross itself. So uh, mankind tried to worship many things. He's trying to create things that even if we go to the pharaohs, they worshiped the Nile, they worshiped animal. They thought that there is a power behind them, but they don't know that power. So when Jesus came and he became the mediator between man and God, he is the one that we call upon because he went to the cross and he know our sinful nature. If you go to God with sinful nature, you cannot see God. God is holy and holiness and sinful sin cannot mix together. So with his death on the cross, mediating between man and God, by his blood, we are made clean and pure so we can face, can enter to the Holy of Holiness and see God again. So that's very important message of Jesus when he came to our earth and we are celebrating his birthday and uh, he is a mediator. He can connect us with God. He can cleanse us, he can forgive our sins, he can touch us, he can heal us. And we really, when we see God, God doesn't see us as we are. He sees us through the blood of Christ that we are cleansed and pure by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Joseph. Um, I'd like to go back to you, Joe, because while, while we were away, I was thinking of a question. You had mentioned, James, that, that you believe God is one, you do well. The demons also believe it and shudder. And for people who go to church, for people who are thinking about coming to faith in Christ, my question to you is, what is the difference between the devil who knows Jesus is real better than anybody on earth and 
and what we have to believe in order to have saving faith? Oh, good question. Great question. Uh, th this is something that, that stumps non-believers and skeptics because, as I said, it's not simply enough to make mere mental assent to the fact that Jesus was who he claimed to be, that he, that he was, in fact, a historical figure. We have to put, um, as I'd like to say, we have to put our complete faith and trust in what Jesus accomplished on, our, on the cross for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And it, it's easy to understand this concept if, if I just simply use an illustration. Um, we, we drive our cars every day, and, and quite often, as we're driving along, we approach a bridge. Now, we can have faith that that bridge is going to hold up. We, we know mentally, we know from the laws of physics, and we know from past experience that if I cross that bridge, there's a good chance that, uh, that I'm going to get safely to the other side. But simply having that mental ascent is not enough. In order to demonstrate the fact that we believe we have to put our trust and we have to actually make the journey across that bridge. We have to put a complete trust in making the journey across the bridge and demonstrating that that bridge is in fact going to hold us up. Same illustration with a chair. I can say, I can look at a chair and say, I believe if I, if I sit in that chair, it's going to support me, but I'm not putting my faith and trust in it until I actually sit in the chair and put the full weight of my body upon that chair. That's the essential difference between simply having mental assent to the fact that Jesus was who he claimed to be and putting our complete faith and trust in his completed work on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. It's actually taking action in what we believe to be true. That, that is an amazing truth. And I, that is the kind of, of saving faith that, that Jesus is looking for, friends. And I would encourage you to make that commitment to Jesus as Savior and follow him as Lord. Tony, I have a question for you. You know, in the birth narrative, the angels say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to all men. And, and, and a lot of times we quote that and that's where the quote stops. But in the, the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill to all men upon whom his favor rests. Is this really saying that God's favor doesn't rest on everybody? Well, we need to look at systematic theology. We need to look at what the Bible says. We need to uh, see what it says as a whole when it talks about God's love. And God loves all people in the sense that we are all made in the image of God. Every single human being bears the image of God. Every Christian, every non-Christian, including Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and everybody else. That's why everyone has intrinsic value, and we as Christians should love all people regardless of what man-made religion they happen to follow, or even no religion. Knowing that this person is made in the image of God, this person was created for the purpose of knowing God and making Him known, and being reconciled to the God of the universe. Of course, none of us are good. None of us can have any uh, amount of good works to make up for our bad. We can't earn our way into heaven. We can't bribe God with anything that we do. Uh, God doesn't need our good works, our neighbor does. So God doesn't gain anything from us before we become a Christian or even after we become a Christian. But God uses us as his instrument after we become a Christian to go out and share the gospel, to let more people know about the truth that we've come to know ourselves. God loves all people and that they're made in his image. And at the same time, there's other attributes that describe God as well. God doesn't have a certain amount of love, and therefore he's uh, love, more loving than, say, human beings. God is love, and human beings can reflect that attribute of God in the things that we do. But God is also just, and he cannot let a guilty person go. So he must, by nature, punish lawbreakers, and that's all of us. And we cannot be saved by our works. It's a gift of God. Salvation is a gift, and Jesus Christ was the ultimate gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. If we look up all the verses in the Bible that talk about God's love, other than the one verse which just says God is love, other than that, every time we look up what it says about love, it always points to the cross, because the cross was the ultimate expression of God's love. But of course, the death on the cross and the resurrection would have only been possible 
if Jesus came into the world to begin with. Now, of course, Jesus is the name given to the eternal person in human flesh, but the son slash word who we read about uh, was with God, and the word was God 13 verses later, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that is our great celebration come Christmas time, is celebrating, as Joe said, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Tony. Pastor Joseph, um, is there, I got a sense from the Holy Spirit there's a little something on your mind that you wanted to say. Would you, is there something you'd like to share with us? I would like to share uh, the meaning of Jesus coming to our world. We know that is the, the subject is very broad and we can say many things about Jesus that came to give us as, as this Christmas we celebrate. One of them is the peace, the Prince of Peace. I, my mind goes back to the Middle East, to the city of Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the church of the birth of Christ there. And uh, while they're ce celebrating, this area is surrounded by armies, wars and powers is trying to destroy things around us. It just, Jesus came to bring peace. And we recognize in our world, if you go to the United Nations, you go to the uh, Security Council, they signed, they signed agreements after agreements and they signed them today, they throw them in the trash tomorrow. And we know that in our world, there is superpowers and there is armies and there is rockets and there is airplanes. And they think by combining all of these agreements or these forceful armies, that powerful armies that, that can defend the peace and make peace. But the Bible, he said some of his characters, this uh, for, uh, for unto us a child is born, one of his characters, the Prince of Peace. That means the peace that which passes our understanding. The world has never seen that peace till the Prince of Peace comes. This is the birthplace of Jesus in Israel, in the Middle East, and we find all of that turmoil there. Where is the peace? And the people are looking for agreements, for powerful armies to protect it. We cannot protect peace by aeroplanes or by guns or by agreements. I think peace comes from the heart. When the Prince of Peace comes and he brings his peace, his salvation, his healing, his peace, the real peace that we are all looking for, we're trying to look everywhere, it's Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Uh, we're talking about the meaning of Christ's birth. And I want to go back to Tony, and I want to ask you about uh, a piece of scripture from uh, 1 John uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 8. It says, The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And here's the point I want you to explain to us, please, Tony. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. What were the works of the devil, and how did Christ destroy them. We see that Satan is called the god of this world. <clears throat> Satan, although uh, cannot create like God can create, he obviously is a tempter. He tempted Jesus himself, the eternal Son of God in human flesh. But yet, because Jesus was without sin, and he was an eternal person in human flesh, of course, you know, he can't sin. He can't, God can't sin. Therefore, Jesus can't sin because he's God the Son in human flesh. But the works of the devil are something that has been ever since the beginning, when uh, the serpent tempted Adam and Eve, and they both disobeyed God, and sin came into the world and death through sin. And we see that even Cain and Abel didn't have a, a good relationship right there at the end, right? And we see that Satan has tempted people. He has... Um, allowed people to serve him. He wants everyone to serve him. He wants people to worship him. He hates God. He hates Christians. He hates people who are made in the image of God. And yet, we all are slaves to sin. We are slaves to the works of the devil until we actually 
become children of God. And that's not children of God in just a title, or, oh yeah, a lot of people are called child of God, but actually being born again, which Jesus said every person must be. Unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So all of us, we are slaves to sin. Some people, of course, sin more than others, uh, depend, depending on their environment and who, you know, their parents and the way that they grew up and stuff. Uh, same pe some people are way deep into sin. Other people um, aren't nearly as bad. And, and unfortunately, that uh, relativity in the sin that people commit causes many people to be self-righteous and say, hey, I'm better than him, I'm better than her, and therefore I'm right with God. But the fact is, is that we are all slaves to sin, we are all uh, lawbreakers, and Satan is tempting all of us, and even without Satan tempting us, we're still, by nature, children of wrath. We sin against God, and unless we look at his perfect standard, the Ten Commandments, we don't realize how bad we really are in light of God's holiness. So, when Jesus came into this world and fulfilled that prophecy of God uh, redeeming the world and, and sending a Messiah, who Jesus is, uh, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil um, in, in, the, in so far as sin cannot no longer have any hold on people who repent and put their trust in Christ. It doesn't mean that we're perfect after we repent and put our trust in Christ, but we are no longer slaves to sin. And even if people don't worship Satan, they're still actually serving Satan if they aren't serving the one true God. Again, Satan's called the God of this world, and there are many people who are still under uh, his control, his temptations, and all of that. That's why the gospel needs to continue to be spread throughout the world so people can come to know the one true God of the universe and not just the God of this world, as the Bible calls him. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I'd like to come to you. One of my favorite passages at this time of year is from Isaiah, uh, chapter 9, uh, verses 6 and 7. It says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of the governance or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. What does this beautiful text, Handel's Messiah was written on this beautiful text to celebrate uh, the birth of Christ. What is, what is this text trying to teach us? Wow, I, I hope I'm coming through because it looks like, it looks like my video is frozen up. But to answer your question, um, it, it really gets down to what is the essential meaning of, of Christmas for us? Mm -hmm. And I think it, com it, it comes down to this. If, it, there, are, there are many world religions that claim to worship a god or a deity, but Christianity is unique in, in this sense. Christianity is the only religion where we don't have to try to reach up to meet God. He came down to meet us. And that's, that's, that's the significant difference and the essential meaning of what Christmas is all about, particularly for Christians. Um, if you were God and you wanted to interact with, with your creation, don't you think the best way to achieve that would to be to come as part of your creation yourself? and to interact with your, with your created beings so that they can experience a personal relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. That's what we see from the very beginning of the Bible, back in, 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 in Genesis, in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. It says, the Lord God was walking and talking in the Garden of Eden, in the cool of the day, with Adam and Eve, and he called out to them. Why did he call out to them? Because he wanted to establish a relationship with them. That's the essential difference between all the other gods and the God that we worship. Our God wants to be in constant relationship with us, and that's the essential meaning of, of Christmas and why he had to come. Oh, that the God of all the universe, the God who said, let there be, and it was, wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us through his son, Jesus Christ. Pastor Joseph, um, what do you think about uh, God wanting to have this relationship with us through Jesus Christ, that he even wants to relate to us um, even through uh, our brokenness and sin? 
that's an amazing question. I mean, uh, as I said in the beginning, sacrifices didn't do the work. Then God, as a sovereign God, when he created us, he said we were created on his image, his likeness of love, faith, uh, many values there in that image of God. So it seems mankind lost that image. That image was gone. It didn't, the sacrifices didn't work. So when Jesus came on earth, he has a plan. The plan was the redemption of mankind. That's the whole purpose of his coming, to redeem that relationship that was lost between mankind and God. And one of the things that's about Jesus, he, he is an everlasting. Uh, the Bible said Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's something, the continuity of his, his personality is an everlasting father, uh, as it's mentioned in Isaiah. Uh, it makes us get out of our logic. Sometimes with people, we have watches, we have calendars, we have months, we have years. God has the three in one, yesterday and today and forever. This is Jesus that we depend on to save us, to heal us, to connect us with God, to make us holy, to touch us as human beings. I mean, it's beyond my comprehension that God can see our yesterday and today and forever, and he's willing to invite us again to his kingdom. Amen. And he does invite us into his kingdom through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Ephesians teaches us it's through the gospel and through this new, new birth that uh, we are adopted into God's family, actually adopted and become his sons and daughters. We encourage you uh, to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And um, we're going to go uh, to break in a couple of minutes. And uh, I want to, do, before we go to break, uh, Joe, we have two minutes till break. Um, would you like to share what uh, is on your heart and mind about this topic with everyone before we go to the break? Oh, gosh, I, I think it's been repeated throughout the, the first hour that we've been on here. And, and, and it's this. Um, we live during a time, and we're celebrating in, in a couple days, the most phenomenal event that has ever occurred in mankind's history. God coming down to abide with us, to dwell among us, as, 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 as he's called Emmanuel, which, which means God with us. God was with us. God wants to be in relationship with us. There's a God out there who loves you who wants to be in relationship with you. He has purchased your salvation. He has purchased your redemption. He has purchased your forgiveness. He wants to spend eternity with you. What greater gift can you be offered? And why would you not accept the greatest gift God has offered to mankind through Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate? And we encourage you to, people, uh, to call in and talk to us, 248-413, or 416, I'm sorry, 1300, with your questions. And uh, we're going to go to break, and we'll be back with you in just a few minutes. As it is Avian's mission to go and make disciples of all nations, our discipleship program has spread to several different languages. Reach out to them. He wants you to break up of every division. Any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We started out with these languages, but coming soon are even more. Stay tuned to see these programs come to ABN. Now in the palm of your hand is the updated ABN SAD app. 
so you can now watch all the programs, shows, and channels in different languages. You can download the app in the App Store related to your device. Once downloaded, you will see six different categories within the ABN SAT app. The first category being the English category, which includes 18 different channels. The Arabic category includes 31 channels. The Worship category has five channels. The Discipleship category includes five channels as well. For more information, please call the numbers on your screen or visit our website at trinitychannel.com. Trinity Channel is now airing live 24-7 on our YouTube channel. Apologetics, debates, and discipling are now constantly streaming for all of our YouTube viewers. Be sure to comment on, like, and share our stream to support Trinity Channel's efforts to disciple all nations. Watch live on YouTube today. The Cross and the Crescent with Pastor Joseph will now be live on satellites to North America, Australia, and New Zealand through Galaxy 19 and Optus D2 every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Watch and call into the show to talk to the good pastor about his weekly topic, which highlights the differences between Islam and Christianity. Watch The Cross and the Crescent live with Pastor Joseph on satellite every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As it is ABN's mission to go and make disciples of all nations, our discipleship program has spread to several different languages. Reach out to them. He wants you to break up of every division. Any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We started out with these languages, but coming soon are even more. Stay tuned to see these programs come to ABN. Hello and welcome back to our uh, Christmas show and with me are uh, uh, Joe and Tony and uh, Pastor Joseph and we will continue our discussion on uh, why Jesus came into the world. Um, Pastor Joseph, uh, how does uh, 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 Jesus' birth relate to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Uh, 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 that's a very important uh, aspect of uh, when Jesus was crucified, he rose again, and he promised his disciple, he's still with us. He will be sending the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, to stay with us forever. So Jesus is not with us physically now, but we know that the Holy Spirit is with us. And uh, the Holy Spirit guides, the Holy Spirit shows us the plan of God in our lives, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit has a lot of things to do with the Christian life, to lead us uh, even. So if you read in Acts chapter 2, 33, therefore being by the right hand of God, exalted, that's about Jesus, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, uh, which ye now see and hear. Uh, so some of the celebration of our season here. We celebrate Jesus, we celebrate gifts, we celebrate many things with our families, and the whole thing is about giving and giving and giving, because Christianity without giving is not Christianity. So the Holy Spirit also is with us during that season to direct us, to teach us, to convict us on sin, and that's part of the character of the Trinity that uh, Jesus promised to be with us forever. Thank you, Pastor Joseph. I have, a, I have another question that I'd like to ask Tony. And Tony, why is it important to the world to know about the true Jesus? 
Well, that's a very important question. I know there's a lot of people out there who have neighbors, coworkers, friends, family members, etc., who say they believe in Jesus. But the thing is, is that when you ask people who is Jesus, you many times get completely different answers, especially if you ask a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon, a Muslim, who is Jesus? Well, the Jehovah's Witness is going to say, well, he's Michael the Archangel in human flesh. A Mormon's going to say that Jesus is a God, but he's separate than God the Father. So there's at least two different gods there. And of course, a Muslim would say that Jesus is just a prophet. He's not God. The Son of God is just a title. Other people are called Son of God as well. But of course, the Bible tells us, and we as Christians know, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God incarnate. In the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 37, uh, Pilate, Pilate, uh, Pontius Pilate, um, he asked Jesus, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus talked about truth. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But obviously, if you have an idea of who Jesus is that does not correspond to what the Bible says, well, then you have the wrong Jesus. So as Joe had talked about earlier, you know, or you'd also mentioned in James uh, 2.19, you know, uh, demons believe and they tremble. Uh, demons know who Jesus is. And R.C. Sproul, uh, a great Bible teacher who just died last week, you know, he said, hey, Satan would get an A in my systematic theology course. <laughs> I mean, Satan knows what is true. He knows who Jesus is. He knows that he is the Son of God incarnate. So we need to know about Jesus, but we need to make sure that we have the correct Jesus. Because in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name? and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So these aren't uh, atheist people here. <laughs> we are reading about people who are doing things supposedly in the name of Jesus, and yet Jesus is gonna say, I never knew you. So these people in the, that we were talking about, who are talked about in this verse, just like so many people in the world today, they, have an idea of who Jesus is, but it's not the Jesus who was found in the New Testament. And even if they follow the Jesus of the New Testament, they have a correct understanding, they don't have any man-made religious view of Jesus, if they are still hoping that their own works is what will actually make them right with God, well, then they are wrong. It's Jesus's sinlessness and perfection and keeping and fulfilling the law and then dying a guilty man's death, and then rising from the dead three days later, that we have any chance at all of being saved. The Bible says we must repent and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And think of it this way. If there is any way for us to be forgiven based on what we do, then Jesus never even had to die. And in fact, he died for no reason. But that isn't the case. The true Jesus of the Bible lets us know who he is, and that he is the only way and he is the only way because he is truth. And if anything is true, well, then every, everything that contradicts that is automatically false. Wow. That is such an important truth. Uh, and I hope that Christians and people who are English speaking and uh, uh, are in the church listen to what you just said. Uh, because there are many people in the church I think who misunderstand or believe in, in, in the wrong Jesus and uh, they are not prepared to meet him at his uh, second coming or at their death. And that, uh, that is a huge risk that, because Christians are just not prepared for meeting Jesus on his terms and who he is. Uh, Joe, what do you think about that and what is going on in the church along those lines? Well, I, I think Tony nailed it pretty well. Um, I don't know how much more I can, I can add to him. <laughs> okay. Um, then let me ask you another question, Joe. 
we have some okay. people who, who are uh, uh, who get onto our Facebook and leave some comments and different things like that that are that are English speaking people. If I were uh, coming to you and I and I would say, Joe, how do I bridge the gap between a Muslim who believes Jesus is a prophet and and what the Bible teaches that Jesus is God, because yes, uh, you know, Jesus did utter some prophecy. So how uh, can we make that transition, that bridge? Okay, yeah, excellent question. Um, and actually, I, I did want to address this. I'll, I'll address, I'll address it another way too. And and it's this: Why don't why don't Muslims accept Christmas? We see we see many. Um, in fact, if you, if you've been listening to the news recently, as I do on, on particularly Muslim stations and Muslim websites and so forth. There have been recent calls from imams for Muslims around the world to disregard um, Christians during this time, to not participate in any Chris Christmas celebrations and so forth. But I have to wonder why don't Muslims in particular um, choose to celebrate Christmas with us and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? And, 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 and it's important because of this. When you read the Quran, um, well, before you go to the Quran, we, we mentioned earlier, the prophet Isaiah said, behold, this will be a sign to you. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth, of a, bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, the question I have from my Muslim friends in particular, and, and anybody else, in, in fact, is, what other virgin has ever conceived in the history of mankind? Muslims believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. In fact, it says in the Quran, in, in Surah Maryam, chapter 19, uh, beginning with verse 19, the angel Gabriel comes to face Mary, and, and the, the angel says, I'm only a messenger from your Lord to announce to you the gift of a righteous son. Verse 20, she said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me, nor am I unchaste. And so it's it's a belief, it is a is a belief in Islam that a virgin gave birth to a son. No other virgin in the history of mankind has, has produced a son. Now, keep in mind, why shouldn't Muslims be celebrating Christmas alongside Christians? Because there's only been one virgin in the history of mankind who has ever been given birth to the son, and it's that son's birthday that we celebrate in a couple days. The importance of the virgin birth, uh, I, I want to also ask you, Joe, is a critical doctrine of the Christian faith. Why is that? It, it, it's a critical, doc, critical doctrine of the Christian faith because um, it had to come from Mary, and the Holy Spirit actually impregnated Mary, this is what we believe, because... Jesus was to be born actually as a second Adam. Adam was created by God. Jesus was created by God, impregnated by the Holy Spirit to live a sinless life for us so that he could live that sinless life and be the propitiation for our sins when he shed his blood upon the cross. It is, it is one of the critical doctrines of the Christian faith because he was the second Adam and had a sinless nature and uh, because uh, uh, Psalm uh, 51 teaches that where David says, surely, surely I was sinful, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Uh, it is a critical doctrine mm -hmm. of the Christian faith because Jesus had a sinless nature. He was the second Adam. Uh, Pastor Joseph, what are your thoughts on, on this particular my topic? My thoughts was again for why Jesus was born. It's redemption of mankind, the redemption of mankind. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned, all have sinned. There is no a perfect person and come short of the glory of God. Uh, of course, Jesus came to give us hope that we can overcome that sin, that we can be born again, that we can renew our relationship with God, that we can be reconciled with God. So that's a very important part of Christianity, of Christ came to redeem mankind. I am talking to many 
viewers now in the Middle East or Australia or America, uh, in, in the Christmas, the poor shepherds, they were poor, they were looking for hope. Uh, their country is occupied with the Roman Empire and they lost hope. In our world, there are many groups of people today, they lost hope of life. And one thing that Jesus came for, to give us life and to give it to us abundantly, he came to redeem us from the punishment of sin. He came to redeem us, to present us to God as pure and holy. He came to redeem us to heal our sickness and disease. He came to redeem us to reconcile us. He came to redeem us to live with joy and happiness. Uh, very important to know the message of Christmas itself. It's all about redemption. Thank you, Pastor Joseph. Tony, I want to uh, come to you uh, uh, about the Quran, which says that the Quran, in the Quran, that, that, that Muslims should be people of the book. Um, when they talk about people of the book, they mean, they mean our Bible. Is that correct? And if so, why do they reject it? Well, a lot of people are not aware of the entire Islamic worldview, and of course not all Muslims believe the same thing. That's why it's most important to look to the actual primary sources and what they say, and then compare what your Muslim neighbor, friend, etc. says or believes compared to that. But don't let them, that person, define Islam, because they don't. Muhammad defined it 1,400 years ago. Uh, uh, in light of that, though, uh, beliefs that are held by many Muslims today, of course, have evolved over time. But the orthodox view is that Islam was the original religion of the entire world, that Adam was a Muslim, Abraham, Moses, all the way up to Jesus. Jesus was a Muslim. He wasn't an eternal son of God incarnate. He was just a prophet, and son of God was just a title. But this got corrupted, and that's how Judaism came about, and then that got corrupted and became what we know as Christianity. And then eventually the Quran was sent down to actually get people back to the original religion that was corrupted to Judaism, Christianity. They believe that these different prophets throughout time did receive a book, that Moses received the, the Psalms. I'm sorry, uh, the Torah. Uh, uh, David received the Zabur, which is the Psalms. And Jesus received the Injil, which sometimes they use the term gospel, but they don't believe like the New Testament where we have the gospels talking about Jesus to them. The Injil, the gospel, is actually a book that was given to Jesus. And then, of course, that got corrupted, even though we have no manuscripts to let us know what it said. Um, and then the Quran was sent down uh, for that for purpose, to get back to the original religion. But Jews and Christians are called the people of the book because— they are the ones who, you know, have a scripture. Um, we don't have a Bible today that they say, oh yeah, that is actually what was received. They claim the Bible's been corrupted, and that's why the Quran had to be sent down. Now, just because Jews and Christians are called people of the book doesn't mean that we're on the same level as, as uh, Muslims. According to Islam, you know, Arabs are the best people, number one, but also Muslims are uh, have, have seniority over all other man-made religions where Judaism and Christianity are a little higher, well, that just means that Jews and Christians were given the third choice. If we look to history in Dimitude, and that Christians and Jews, rather than getting the choices of either convert or die, they were given the third choice of pay the jizya, the poll tax, and then, you know, you, could, you can keep your head, basically. That doesn't mean that they had all the freedom in the world to do whatever they wanted to, they were still living under Sharia. So even though Jews and Christians are called people of the book, and they have a little bit higher status than, say, uh, pagans or um, idolaters or anyone else who Islam wants to label, um, we're still not at the same level according to the Islamic worldview. And of course, this is just completely wrong. It, this is completely in contradiction to what we talked about earlier of all people being made in the image of God having intrinsic value because of their nature and not because of a particular religion that they follow. So we as Christians need to continue to get the gospel out to Muslims. Many times, uh, former Muslims are your best Christians because we see the uh, passion that Muslims have 
for what they believe to be true. But then when they realize that that is false, they realize who Jesus truly is, they repent of their sins, put their trust in Christ, and put their hope in him rather than their self-righteous works, and they are born again. These former Muslims become die-hard Christians, even more passionate for the truth than they previously were for a lie. Wow. You know, as, as you were talking, I was sitting here thinking that really the birth of Jesus Christmas turned uh, the Muslim world upside down uh, when, when God brought his truth into the world in Jesus Christ. And it turned the rest of the world upside down as well. Um, Joe, what do you think about uh, how God has used the birth of Jesus uh, to turn the world upside down? Great question. I, actually, I'm going to answer that by bouncing back to something Pastor Joseph said earlier. Um, you were reading uh, the different terms, the different names that Jesus would be called, and one of them was the Prince of Peace. And I, I give my testimony when I speak at churches around, around the country. I travel frequently and, and educate churches on how to reach out to Muslims. And when I give my testimony, I share this. Um, when God first called me into this full-time ministry many, many years ago, I was working in, in, in the corporate world. I was in middle management, and I told my coworkers what I was going to be doing. And they thought it was crazy, and I said, look, look at it this way. Um, we're fighting a so-called war on terror. That was many years ago. We're still fighting that similar war. And I said, here's the deal. We will never know true world peace until every Muslim meets the Prince of Peace. And I would take that even further. We will not know true world peace until every person on earth knows the Prince of Peace. And it's that Prince of Peace whose birth we are celebrating this, this week in, in just a few days. He changed the world. He turned the world upside down and brought peace to all mankind. They just need to reach out and accept it. I, I, that's profound, too, because, you know, my favorite book of the Bible is Ephesians. And it says in chapter 2 that Jesus is our peace. He is, he is our peace. Uh, he, is the, he is the peace between a Jew and Gentile. Uh, and he, through him, a whole new race of humanity is created by faith in Jesus Christ. This, the, the story of Christmas, ladies and gentlemen, is huge beyond imagination. Pastor Joseph and I were uh, talking earlier before the show began, and we were sharing with each other you know, the amazing things uh, that have happened because of Christmas. And I'm going to turn to Pastor Joseph now and, and ask him uh, to share some of those things that we talked about. I think uh, when we talk about Jesus has to be born, also one of the point to provide the promised seed of Abraham. You know, the Jewish has to connect to Abraham. We as Christians has to connect to Abraham. Islam also has to connect. We are the sons of Islam, Khalilullah. So every religion is trying to really to connect to the original, to be, we are the original, to the seed of uh, Abraham. So let's read uh, together Galatians 3, 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor a Greek. There is neither bond or nor free. There is neither a male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. 29 says, if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Wow. So Jesus is trying to wrap it all together. Uh, no nations, no belief is connected just only to Abraham. But he came to fulfill the seed of Abraham. He came from that seed. So in the end of the story, if you believe in Jesus, you are really are the seed of Abraham. If you believe in Jesus, you are really in your way to God's kingdom. If you believe in Jesus and he washed you by his blood, you are really coming from the seed of Abraham. So when Jesus came and he put it all in that, then you look to the character of Jesus. If you look to the ancients, you listen to the beautiful classical music, it's all was dedicated to the church, to Jesus. Those giants of geniuses of music, if you look to literature, still today, more books are produced 
about this character of Jesus. If you look uh, to politics, you find against and you find for. If you look to the world theater today, Jesus has many followers and Jesus has many people that are rejected him. So the character of Jesus is being worldwide, even empires, civilizations. Jesus was in the center of these civilizations. That is, that, thank you, uh, Pastor Joseph. Uh, we, we were also uh, talking about um, how Jesus seems uh, to bring conflict. And that's part of the birth narrative as well uh, that, that we uh, don't talk about too much. And, but yet, that's what happened. Uh, he brought conflict. And, but conflict is healthy. Conflict is healthy with the church, it, for the church. It helps us sort things out. It helps us to understand what we really believe. You know, we talked a couple of shows ago about the need uh, for revival and for uh, uh, spiritual awakening to happen uh, in our church and in the world. But that comes with conflict. It comes with uh, uh, controversy. And uh, uh, the birth of Jesus brought controversy. The birth of Jesus brought, brought conflict. And I want to ask uh, 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 Tony, if, if you're still there, um, why is that? Why is conflict controversy healthy for the church? And how? And and, and even in the in the uh, we find out that that Herod decided uh, to kill all the children to try to get to Jesus um, because it brought conflict, it brought controversy. Um, can you expound on that a little bit, please? Well, we, in hindsight, hindsight's twenty twenty, as as we all know. And looking back now, looking at Herod and looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, at that time when Jesus was born. Uh, Herod was the big king, quote unquote, and Jesus was the little king. And yet this big king feared this little king because uh, Herod was not a Jew, and he had heard about this king who would be king of who was king of the Jews. And when the wise men had come to him and he said, "Hey, you know, let me know where he is so I can go worship him as well." Of course, we all know that that wasn't Herod's intention. And then after the wise men went and visited Jesus and Mary and Joseph, then they took off in a different direction. They didn't visit Herod on the way back. And just like back then, uh, these worldly powers, uh, the principalities, and, and just the people who are appointed by God uh, throughout time, there, there have been many evil rulers like Herod and other people. But we also need to know that God is sovereign and that nothing happens outside of God's control. Even Satan can't do anything more than God allows him to do. How much less can any mortal human being do something without God allowing it? God causes things to happen. He allows things to happen. And every single person throughout time, every ruler, every president, every uh, leader of any country, even dictators, they were actually in place because God allowed that to happen or he put someone in place. We see how God used evil men throughout the Old Testament. He still used them for his glory in some way. And everyone who is uh, appointed by God isn't anointed by God. And Herod was one of those people who were appointed. Again, he couldn't have been king unless God allowed that. But he was not a Christian. He did not repent of his sins and put his trust in this little king. He wanted to be the only king. And he wanted all of these uh, babies and, 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 uh, and people killed because he didn't know who it was. And yet he feared him so much that he, he caused this other death to happen as well. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see the effects of the fallen world that we live in. It shouldn't surprise us when non-Christians don't act like Christians. And we shouldn't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. We need to continually get the gospel out there and be the light of the world, be salt and light in a dark world. This is what Jesus was. This is what he calls us as Christians to be. Jesus has ascended. He is now with the Father. He's still a man. He is still an eternal person in human flesh. And yet we as Christians are still here to glorify God and to make him known and to be used by God in, in mighty ways as, as all of us are 
are when we you know, do shows that are spread throughout the world, and Joe has a website, and Pastor Joseph does shows, and Pastor Vance, you're a pastor preaching to a, a, a flock every, every week. We're all being used by God in different ways to equip the saints, to defend historic Christian faith, to proclaim the gospel that everybody needs to hear. And Herod, the big king, really, in the end, is the little king. And Jesus, who was the little king, is the big king. So Jesus is who we need to look to. Jesus is who we need to tell people about. And we let people know that God is in control, and God commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. But God also so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that is what we are celebrating in just a couple of days from now. Well spoken. Thank you. Um, the, the control room tells me that we're beginning to uh, uh, run out of time, so I'd like to come to each one of you, please, and, and ask for your closing statements. Uh, we'll start with Joe. Uh, whatever God and the Holy Spirit has put on your heart, Joe, please share it with the world about the Christmas season. Yeah, thank thank you for the opportunity, and, and and I echo your frustration. The clock is always my worst enemy when I'm when I'm teaching, when I'm preaching, when I'm uh, educating flock. But here here's what I want to leave your listening audience today. In a couple of days, we're going to wake up on Christmas morning, and we're going to exchange gifts with one another. We're going to unwrap presents. We're going to give each other the gift. And we do this in celebration of two things. Number one, in, in, in memory and commemoration of the gifts that the Magi brought to Jesus, the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh. But even more importantly and, and more profoundly, the gift that God gave us that precious morning, when he gave us the gift of himself, when he came down, when he, when he left his heavenly abode, abode, as we read in Philippians earlier, and humbled himself to the point of becoming a man. And as a, as a, as a sinless man, humbled himself even further to the point of dying on the cross as a sinless man, being that, that spotless lamb whose blood was sacrificed. He offered himself up as a sin sacrifice for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. He offers this to you today, my friends, as a free gift. You only have to reach out and grab it. You only have to accept that gift. And no gift does you any good until you actually accept it. I can offer you everything that I have but it does you no good until you accept it. So I challenge you today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, accept the gift that he offers to you today. Don't wait another day. Amen. Amen. Don't wait another day because you don't know what tomorrow might bring. Pastor Joseph, will you share uh, your closing Amen. thoughts with the world, please? Jesus has to be born because of mankind's sin. Jesus has to be born because God wanted to reveal his own character to humanity. Jesus has to be born to remove the sin of mankind through a perfect sacrifice. Jesus has to be born for mankind to have a mediator with God. Jesus has to be born also to provide the promised seed of Abraham. Jesus has to be born from God to make his spirit available to all mankind. Lastly, Jesus has to be born for God to redeem mankind. Thank you, Pastor Joseph. Tony, would you uh, uh, provide us with your closing thoughts as God the Holy Spirit is speaking into your heart and mind? If God can create the universe ex nihilo, if he can create the heavens and the earth out of nothing, then he is more than capable of entering into creation if he decides to. And that was the plan from the very beginning, before he even... Uh, created the heavens and the earth. He had a plan, and that plan was to make himself known and to have a relationship with people who he would create. He made Adam and Eve, and he knew everyone who would exist since then. He knows our beginning and our ends. God is eternal. He doesn't have to look forward till tomorrow like we have to. He doesn't experience things in time like we do. And yes, about 2,000 years ago, it was the fullness of time. Fullness of time in uh, regards to human beings, not in fullness of time of God, because again, he's eternal, but he sent his eternal son into the world. The Father did not take on human flesh. The Holy Spirit did not take on human flesh. The second person, the Son, the Word, took on a second nature. He came into this world for the purpose of dying, 
He was the perfect lamb sacrifice. The Bible also calls Jesus the image of the invisible God. I mean, think about it. When you read the words of Jesus himself, who was more God-like than Jesus? I mean, no one was more Christ-like than Jesus, right? <laughs> no one was more God-like than Jesus either. When you look at uh, the things that he did, the things that he said about himself, the things that he said about his father, saying, hey, you know, glorify me uh, to, to the, you know, basically allow me to have the, uh, I forget the exact wording here, but basically the, the glory that I had with you before the world was created. Jesus is an eternal person in human flesh. He has a second nature, that human flesh is second nature, but it's just only one person there, and he is eternal. And the hypostatic union, the terminology that we use for the God-man, how one person can have two natures, a divine nature, which is immaterial and cannot die, and a physical human nature, which can die. I mean, an eternal person had a human brain. So, I mean, it's amazing how this all, all happened. But this is who Jesus was, and he was born for the purpose of dying. If he had not been born, then we would have no hope to be reconciled to the one true God of the universe. The second person who is God took on a second nature, lived a perfect life. He proclaimed who he was. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead three days later. So as we celebrate, and as Christians throughout the world celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is great, and we should be so amazed and thankful that the Son was sent into the world. But keep in mind that he was born so that he could die, die for the world, and that everyone who repents and puts their trust in him can once and for all have all of their sins washed away and be reconciled to the God of the universe. Again, not because of anything that we have done, because of what Jesus did on our behalf. Amen. Friends, I want to echo uh, in my closing statement with the uh, uh, other uh, men of God uh, who have been speaking with you tonight. The greatest gift that has ever been given to this world is Jesus Christ. Sin separates us from God, but Jesus reconciles us to God when we come to him in faith, believing him to be not only Savior, but Lord. If the Holy Spirit is talking to your heart this evening and is saying that you need to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, receive the greatest gift that God has ever given. Tell Jesus that yes, I agree with you that my, my sin has separated me from you and that I could never live a life perfect enough to earn heaven. But you sent your son Jesus into the world to die in my place. Tell God I receive him as my savior, that he shed his blood for the forgiveness of my sins. His body was beaten and broken because of my sin. I receive him as my savior. I commit myself to following Jesus as my Lord because as our panel has taught us this evening, Jesus is no less than God in the flesh. So Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he is God. Commit to following him as Lord. And brothers and sisters in the church as well, I ask that you recommit this Christmas season to following Jesus as your Lord, because he is God. And he has every right to your life because you've given it to him. Friends, if you have received Jesus for the first time this evening, please call us and let us know about your commitment. And on behalf of all of us, we thank you for uh, listening this evening. We thank you for tracking with us. We thank you for uh, God's gift that you have received if you are a Christian and God's gift that you are receiving tonight if you pray to ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. My name is Pastor Vance Walker. 
and I've been your host for these fundraising things, and it's been an honor and a joy. On behalf of all of us, we wish you a very Merry Christmas, a Christmas peace, and a Happy New Year. Good night, thank you, and God bless you.